Jack and the Beanstalk In the days of King Alfred there lived in a lonesome part of England a poor widow with her son Jack. She had a cottage, a meadow, and a cowshed, and one cow to eat in the meadow, sleep in the shed, and supply the cottage with milk and butter. The widow had one son. His name was Jack, and he was a thriftless, idle lad without thought for his mother or the morrow. She had to do all the work, and he had all the pleasure. If the widow had not petted and spoiled her boy, he would have been a comfort to her and not a trouble. If she had made him work instead of letting him run idle, he would have been happier. As her poverty increased, and Jack increased at the same time, and required larger shoes, longer stockings, and more broadcloth for his back, the mother disposed of all her little goods, one after another, to supply his necessities. He brought nothing into the housekeeping, but took a great deal out, and he had not the wits to see this. At length there remained only the cow to be disposed of, and the widow, with tears in her eyes, said to her son, "'Jack, my dear boy, I have not money enough to buy you a new suit of clothes, and you are out of elbows with your jacket, have knocked out the toes of your boots, and have worked your knees through to your breeches. Nothing remains for us but to part with the cow. Part with her we must. I cannot bear to see you in rags and disreputable.' Jack said his mother was quite right to consider his personal appearance. Then the widow bade him take the cow to market and sell her. Jack consented to do this. As he was on his way, he met with a butcher, who asked him whither he was going with the cow. Jack said he was going to market to sell her. "'What do you want for her?' asked the butcher. "'As much as I can get,' answered Jack. "'That's spoken sensibly,' said the butcher." And now I know with whom I have to deal. It's always a pleasure to treat with a man of business habits and with plenty of intelligence. With him one knows where one is, but with a fool and a scatterbrain, I ask, where are you? Exactly, said Jack. Where are you? Jack was vastly gratified at being called a man, and a man of business to boot, and with plenty of intelligence on top of that. Come, said the butcher. Between you and me, as businessmen, what will you take for the cow? Now he had in his hands some curious beans of various colors, red and violet, spotted purple and black. Jack had never seen the like before, and he looked curiously at them. Ah, said the butcher, I see you're a chap as knows what is what. In one moment, without speaking a word, them eyes of yours went into my hand, looking at my scarlet runners. There's no cheating you. You know the value of a thing by the outside. Girth, you do. Well, if I was dealing with anyone else, I'd say, three scarlet runner beans for the cow. But as you're an old hand and a weary bird, I'll give you six. Jack eagerly closed the bargain. Such a chance might never occur again, so he gave the man the cow and walked home with the six beans in his hand. When his mother saw the beans and heard what Jack had to say, her patience forsook her. She threw away the beans in a rage, and they were scattered all over the garden. The poor woman was very sad over her loss. She cried all evening, and she and Jack had to go supperless to bed. When Jack awoke the next morning, he was surprised that the sun did not stream in at his window in the manner it was wont to do, but twinkled as through dense foliage. When he rose from his bed and went to the window, he saw to his great astonishment that a large plant had sprung up in the night and had grown in front of the cottage, and that its green leaves and scarlet flowers obscured the light from entering his chamber as fully as of old. He ran downstairs into the garden and saw that the beans had taken root and had sprung up. The stalks were entwined and twisted like a stout trunk or formed a ladder, and this mounted quite out of sight for the clouds, as they drifted by, passed across the bean without ever reaching the top. Jack very speedily resolved to climb the beanstalk and see whither it mounted. In the meantime, his mother had come forth, no less astonished than himself. But when he told her it was his intention to scramble up the beanstalk, then she entreated, threatened, and forbade him. He must not go. He would run extraordinary risks. He would break her heart. 
Jack had been too long his own master and too regardless of his mother's feelings to pay attention to what she said. He put his hands to the tangle of stalks and found it extremely easy to climb. So he set to work and began his ascent, pausing at intervals to look round and observe the scenery as it grew small below him. After scrambling for several hours, he passed through a thick layer of flaky cloud and found that the uppermost shoots and tendrils of the bean were there. They had fallen over and were straggling across the upper surface of the cloud. Looking about him, Jack discovered that he was in a very strange country. It appeared to be a desert, without tree or shrub. Here and there were scattered masses of stone, and here and there also were masses of crumbling soil. Jack was so fatigued that he sat himself down on a stone and thought of his mother and the distress she was in, and a pang of remorse entered his heart. Then he heard the croak of a crow, and looking up he saw a black bird perched on a rock. It said to him, Kara! Kara! I am a fairy, and I will tell you why you are here. Your father was a great man and rich, and one day a cruel giant came and killed him and carried off all his goods, and unless your mother had hidden herself with you in the sheep pen, he would have destroyed you both as well. She fled with what little she could collect together, carrying you on her back, and she has lived ever since in great poverty, and her poverty and sorrows have not been lightened by any signs of consideration and deference shown by you— I am speaking to you now, not that I care for you or desire to do you good for your own worthless sake, but because I am grateful to your mother, and I know that I cannot give her greater pleasure than by serving and saving you, and I hope that in future you will behave better to her. You must know that though I am a fairy, my power is not continuous. Every hundred years there comes a time when it fails, and I am obliged to live on earth subject to extreme poverty and privation, and to be reduced to the utmost destitution, and that I can only be released from this condition by one who will give me to eat her last crumb, and to drink her last drop, and will comb my head with her golden comb. Now, yesterday, whilst you were away driving the cow to market, I came begging to your mother's door. She was so good, so charitable, that she gave me the last particle of bread that remained in the house, and the last drop of milk that remained in the pan, and then, seeing that I was without any of those articles of toilet which make life happy, she seated me on a stool, and with her golden comb, the only article of luxury that remained to her, she combed out my long black tresses. Now no sooner had she done this, and spread my black hair all over me, than I was transformed into a crow, and as a crow I flew away, and a crow I remain— until I can peck the three golden hairs out of the mole that grows on the tip of the giant's nose, that is, of the giant who slew your father. In order to reward your mother, and also to advance my own interest, I flew over you as you were making a great ass of yourself with the butcher, who was laughing in his sleeve to think what a greenhorn you were, and how easily gulled by a little vulgar flattery, and I dropped among the scarlet runner beans three of a very different kind from those the butcher was giving you, and it is these three magical beans out of fairyland that have grown to such a size and up which you have climbed. You are now in the country where lives the giant. You will have difficulties and dangers to encounter, but you must persevere in avenging the death of your father, and in doing all you can to enable me to get the three golden hairs out of the mole at the end of the ogre's nose. One thing I charge you strictly. Do not let your mother know of your adventures till all are accomplished. The knowledge would be more than she could endure. Jack promised that he would obey the directions of the fairy. Then she said, Go along due east over this barren plain. You will soon arrive at the ogre's castle. Then the crow spread its wings and flew away. Jack walked on and on, till at last he saw a large mansion. A woman was standing in the doorway. 
He accosted her and begged a morsel of bread in a night's lodging, as he was desperately hungry and excessively weary. She expressed great surprise at seeing him, and said that it was an uncommon thing for a human being to pass that way, for it was well known that her husband was an ogre, who devoured human flesh in preference to all other meats, that he did not think anything of walking fifty miles to procure it, and that usually he was abroad all day questing for it. This account terrified Jack. Nevertheless, he was too weary and famished to think of proceeding further. Besides, he remembered the injunction of the fairy to avenge his father's death. He entreated the woman to take him in for that night only, and to lodge him in the oven. The good woman at length suffered herself to be persuaded, for she was of a compassionate disposition. She gave him plenty to eat and drink in the kitchen, where a pleasant fire was burning. Presently... The house shook, for the giant was approaching, and the woman hastily thrust Jack into the oven. Next instant the giant entered, and holding his nose high in the air, shouted in a voice of thunder, Ha! I smell fresh meat! My dear, answered his wife, it is only the calf we killed this morning. The ogre was appeased and called for his meal, the good woman hastened to satisfy him and spread the table and put on it a pie that would have taken ten men to consume it in ten days. The ogre finished it at a sitting, and when he had done, he desired his wife to bring him his crimson and gold hen. Jack could look through a crevice in the door of the oven, and he saw that the giant's wife, after having removed the supper, brought in an osier cage and out of this cage took a hen that had the most magnificent plumage ever seen, shot with green and gold and crimson. When the giant said, Lay, then at once the hen laid an egg of solid gold that shone like the sun. The ogre amused himself a long while with the hen. Meanwhile his wife was washing up the supper things in the back kitchen, at length, the giant wearied of the somewhat monotonous sport and fell fast asleep by his fireside, and Jack now stole out from the oven, tucked the hen under his arm, slipped through the house door, and ran as fast as his legs could carry him due west till he reached the head of the beanstalk, and he descended it rapidly and successfully, always carrying the hen under his arm. His mother was overjoyed to see him. He found her crying bitterly and lamenting his fate, for she had been sure he had come to a shocking end through his rashness. Jack showed her the hen. "'See, mother,' said he, "'here's an end to our toil and trouble. Now I hope to make some amends for all the grief I've caused you.' The hen laid them as many eggs as they desired. They sold them, and in a little time they were rich enough to buy cows and a new suit for Jack." and a best gown for his mother. But Jack was not easy. He recollected the command of the fairy, that he was to avenge his father and work for her release from the form of a crow. Accordingly, he made up his mind to climb the beanstalk and visit Cloudland once more. One day he told his mother his purpose, and she tried to dissuade him from it. But as she saw that he was firmly resolved to do what he said— and with her fears to some extent allayed by the successful issue of his first expedition, she desisted from her attempt. Moreover, she did not know what dangers he would run, for, obedient to the instructions of the fairy, he had told her nothing of the ogre that lusted after human flesh and of his concealment in the oven. Knowing that the giant's wife would not again willingly admit and harbor him, he thought it necessary on this occasion to totally disguise himself. Accordingly, with walnut, he dyed his hands and face black and put on the new suit which had been purchased out of the money bought by the sale of the golden eggs. Very early one morning he started and climbed the beanstalk. He was greatly fatigued when he reached the top and very hungry. Having rested for some time on the stones, he pursued his journey to the ogre's castle. He reached it late in the evening, and he found the woman standing at the door as before. Jack accosted her and begged that she would give him a night's lodging and something to eat. She replied that the giant, her husband, ate human flesh in preference to all other meat, 
that on one occasion she had taken in and hidden a beggar boy who had run away carrying off something that her husband prized greatly. Jack tried hard to persuade the woman to receive him, but he found it a hard task. At length she yielded and took him into the kitchen where she gave him something to eat and drink and then concealed him in the clothes hutch. Presently the ogre entered with his nose in the air shouting, Ha! Ha! I smell fresh meat. His wife replied that a kid had been killed that day, and this kid he doubtless scented. Then she hastened to produce his supper, for which he was very impatient, and constantly upbraided her with the loss of his hen. The giant at last, having satisfied his voracious appetite, said to his wife, Bring me the money bags that I took out of the castle down on earth. Then Jack knew that it was his father's money the ogre was going to look at. He peeped from his hiding place and saw the woman enter carrying two money bags into the room. She placed them before her husband, who at once opened them and poured forth from one bezants, that is to say gold coins, and from the other deniers, that is to say, silver coins. The ogre amused himself with counting out his money, and Jack, peeping out from his hiding place, most heartily wished it were his. At length, the giant tired of the great mental exertion of counting. He put the money back into the bags, tied them up, and fell asleep. Jack, believing all was secure, stole from his hiding place and laid hold of one of the bags. Then a little dog that was lying under the table began to bark, and Jack, fearing lest the giant should wake, slipped back into his hiding place. He, however, remained unconscious, snoring heavily. Then the wife, who was washing up in the back kitchen, came in and called the dog to attend her. The coast was now clear. Jack crept out of the hutch, and seizing the bags, made off with them, as they were his father's treasure, which had been carried away by the giant. On his way to the top of the beanstalk, the only difficulty Jack had to encounter arose from the weight of the bags, which burdened him immensely. On reaching the bean plant, he climbed down nimbly, carrying the treasure of gold and silver with him, and on reaching the bottom gave them to his mother. They were now well off, and might have exchanged the cottage for a handsome house— but Jack would in no way consent to this, for he knew that he had not as yet avenged his father and released the fairy. He thought and thought upon the world above the beanstalk, and his mother saw that he was meditating on another expedition. She was sorrowful, as there was really now in her mind no need for anything further, but she knew how resolved her son was when he had made up his mind to anything, and that it was not in her power to dissuade him from it. One midsummer day, very early in the morning, Jack reascended the beanstalk. He found the plain above the clouds as before. He arrived at the giant's mansion in the evening and found his wife standing at the door. Jack had disguised himself so completely that she did not recognize him. He had painted his face and hands with red ochre. When he pleaded hunger and weariness in order to gain admission, he found it very difficult indeed to persuade her. At last he prevailed and was concealed in the copper. When the giant returned in the evening, he lifted his nose and bellowed, Ha! Ha! I smell fresh meat! Some crows have brought a piece of carrion and have left it on the roof, said the wife. I said fresh meat, retorted the giant, and notwithstanding all his wife could say, searched all through the kitchen. Jack was nearly dying with fear and wished himself at home, and when the ogre approached the copper and put his hand on the lid, Jack thought his last hour had struck. The giant, however, forbore from lifting the lid and threw himself into his chair, storming at his wife, whom he accused of having lost him his hen and bags of money. She hastened to dish up supper. He ate greedily and, when satiated, bade the woman bring him his harp. Jack peered from under the copper lid and saw the most beautiful harp that could be imagined. It had a head like an angel and wings. When the harp was placed on the table, the giant shouted, Play! 
whereupon the harp played the most beautiful music of its own accord. The giant listened and fell asleep. Meanwhile, his wife had finished washing up and had retired to bed. Jack crept from the copper and laid hold of the harp, but the harp had instinct, and it cried out, Master! 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 The giant woke, rubbing his eyes, stretched himself, and looked about him. He had eaten and drunk so much that he was stupefied, and he did not understand what had happened in the first moment of being aroused. Meanwhile, Jack ran away with the harp. In a while, the giant discovered that he had been robbed, and he rushed after Jack and threw great stones at him, which Jack fortunately evaded. As soon as he reached the beanstalk, he began to descend, and he ran down as nimbly as might be, and the giant pursued him and began following down the beanstalk. Jack, on reaching the bottom, called for a hatchet. His mother, who saw the danger, immediately brought one, and Jack, with the axe, hewed through the stalks near the root. Consequently, the whole mass with the giant on it fell to the ground, and the fall broke the neck of the ogre. Immediately, hovering overhead, appeared the black crow. It swooped down and picked three golden hairs from a mole that was on the end of the giant's nose. No sooner was that done than the crow was transformed into a lovely fairy. Jack's mother was not a little delighted when she saw the beanstalk destroyed, for now Jack need no longer climb it. He was now allowed by the fairy to tell the whole story, and he not only did this, but begged his mother's pardon for disobedience in past years and promised to amend. He kept his promise, and what with the hen that laid golden eggs and the bag of Bezance and ten years, and the marvelous harp that played of its own accord, Jack and his mother no longer suffered poverty or felt tedium. Notes Jack and the Beanstalk This is probably a genuine old English folk tale. A trace of it is to be found in The Sage of Olaf Tryggvason. In dream he is said to have climbed a tree and got into a land of marvels above the clouds, The tree is Yggdrasil, the world tree that supports the firmament above. The giant who lives above the cloud floor is Odin, or Wotan, with his single eye and with his wife Freya. Wotan is possessed of the red hen that lays the golden egg every morn, that is, the red dawn of which the sun is born, the harp that plays of itself, which is the wind, and the money and jewel bags, which are the clouds that drop fertilizing showers.' 